We're here today with Mary Bond. We have had a week long with this lady and it has been fabulous. Uh, she has done two online workshops for us, which we'll talk about later, and one live training. And we had a packed house and such a great group and we learned so, so much <laughs> from you. So we wanted to do this interview today to give you guys on our site just a little bit of taste of what's coming up in the near future when um, we get finished editing these online workshops. It's been wonderful Thank being you. in Asheville. I love the Southern hospitality. <laughs> it's been really, really yeah, good. Yeah. yeah, and we've eaten lots of great food, right? Fabulous food. Yeah. yeah. We have a resident uh, gourmet cook. Yes. <laughs> the way that you translate the material and the way that um, you've brought the material to us this week has just been like a different paradigm shift to me. It's been oh, great you. and I've learned so much and I'm, I'm really excited for the students on our site to, to get some of this information too. Wow. Thanks for saying that. <laughs> it's true. Well, let's see where I'll start. Uh, I got a master's degree in dance many decades ago <laughs> and just as I was about to accept um, uh, to be on the faculty at the University of Maryland I met Ida Rolf who um, is the founder of structural integration lots of people call it Rolfing kind of a nickname and that was a huge blessing for me uh, I watched her give a demonstration and I just, I, I had received this bodywork on my, my own body, but I didn't understand that it had A, a theory behind it, and B, a philosophy underlying it. So it really um, was wonderful to hear her speak about her work and her vision. <laughs> so that motivated me to become a rolfer. And, um, in the beginning, I don't think I was much good <laughs> because really I was a mover, not a toucher. But I learned to touch over time. And then what happened? I, there was a, some family intervened for about 10 years and I just forgot all about everything. And when I came back to doing the work, Idaroff had passed away and the work had been continued and enhanced and deepened by some of her senior students. So I was able to retrain with them, which was wonderful. And then uh, I took a movement training. Many people don't understand that Rolfing has a whole movement education aspect to it. Yes, I remember you talking about this, and I, I didn't realize yeah, that either. Right. Yeah. I mean, what we're trying to do is not just organized structure, but um, restore efficient movement in the joints and in the whole fascial system. And um, so there was some sort of movement exercises that Ida Roth had, had passed on to the students, you know, the, mm -hmm. her followers, and we had made kind of a <clears throat> program out of it. Um, and I studied that, and in in my process, I'm a writer, I think, in my next life, <laughs> um, in my process was to write down what I had learned in this movement training. So that was the basis of my first book, which is called Balancing Your Body. And then I met a genius who is a, a man named Hubert Godard. He's a movement theorist from France, and he brought a whole new way of understanding movement to the Rolf Institute and to what we do. And it was just, for me, incredibly profound and life-changing, you know, to understand that posture and movement is primarily perceptually based. That it's not all about muscles and fascia, even. Mm -hmm. you know, it's about where you think you are in the moment. And so his way of working is to 
um, which has become my way as well, is to find, figure out what are the missing perceptions for someone? What is keeping them from assuming their natural inheritance? Because we, we have everything perfect for this human body. And what we do is clutter it up with tensions. Mm -hmm. And one way of looking at tensions is that they are um, missing sense of weight in the body. So, or missing sense of spaciousness. So how could I restore spaciousness to the place where it's compressed? Or how could I bring yielding into the place where it's held up? Okay, so rather than working so much with hands-on tissue, I work with uh, the nervous system. Have you always worked that way? No, 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 no. Okay. Just, just really um, since studying with this man, which started in early 90s, and, you know, I haven't been steady at this. I've sort of dropped off uh, working with him and, because I've been busy writing a book and making a DVD. I know his work has gone on and grown, um, but I guess, I guess for me, I felt like what I had learned from Hubert was so, mm, so precious mm -hmm. that we shouldn't be precious about it. Okay, so the Rolf Institute um, shouldn't be the only container for this information. Okay. And of course, Hubert does go around and teach many other populations. Mm -hmm. But I felt like the general public needed access to some of these ideas and some of these explorations and ways of um, ways of looking at your body, not as a machine that's out of out of alignment, you know, but at it as an organism that um, needs more care. That's one thing that I loved about your book, the the new rules of posture, is that you. You give these seemingly simple exercises that are functional things that we're doing all the time. And so I felt like I could read a couple of paragraphs and get this idea, this sense, and kind of think about it all day long mm -hmm. with things that I was doing. Mm -hmm. It's like you don't have to make an appointment for it, right? And you can keep sort of trying to embody that throughout mm -hmm. the day. <clears throat> That's which great. I love which is exactly what I, I was hoping people would do, mm -hmm. you know, so that people who get the book out of the library could get some, some insight, mm -hmm. you know, because people are very disempowered about the bodies in our culture. You know, we, we, we think you have to take it to some sort of expert, you know, mm -hmm. to get fixed. And um, I think really our bodies need to be understood and, and I just personally am very biased about this way of understanding, the way it's organized. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I like to share, you know, with whatever community will have me <laughs> go there and do my, do my song and dance. And how have you seen the, when you go into uh, Pilates teacher trainings or yoga trainings or what have you, how does your work help I know the answer to this question, but I'm wondering, since you've done so many, how does this work translate and help, for example, Pilates teachers bring the work more fully to their clients? I think we all have blind spots mm -hmm. about our own body, our own organization, our own movement. Mm -hmm. And um, the recent... Uh, Neuroscience research talks about mirror neurons. You've read about this. And for me, the idea of mirror neurons is just in a nutshell if you're watching a performance, a sports performance, a ballet, or whatever, your motor neurons are firing even though you, you aren't exactly moving, you know, but you're sensing, feeling the movement that you're watching. So the research also shows that if you've studied that particular art 
performance or sport, even more neurons will be firing. So my thinking about that is that the more we can understand and feel our own bodies and be embodied personally, then that makes more of our neuron neurons fire when we look at a client or when we feel what it is they're, they're talking about. Mm -hmm. now, lots of times what they're talking about is not where their problem is. You know that, <laughs> yes. right? And so the more we can <clears throat> assess where they need more support, where they need more spaciousness, mm -hmm. that comes out of our own bodies finding more support and more spaciousness. In Pilates, we use a lot of visualizations, especially mm -hmm. from, you know, I'm trained through Marie Jose. So that's a big part of our work, mm -hmm. the visualizations to clients and kind of finding the right visualizations along with the right breath that speaks to that client. All right. So do these visualizations <clears throat> also fire these mirror neurons? I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. What is, what's kind of uh, got your attention these days? What are you really thinking more about or delving into or just interested, wanting to maybe go toward? I love writing. Mm -hmm. And um, I find these days that the, the combination of writing and video is very profound because people increasingly don't have time to read. <laughs> Now, they could take time to read my stuff because it's small sentences, <laughs> you know. So if I can read a little bit and then see it, mm -hmm. and that's what, um, when people read the New Rules of Posture, many of them didn't, uh, many of them responded the way you did, that they could take the words off the page and put them inside. But many people thought, oh, that sounds like a good idea, but I, I'd like to see it. So that's mm -hmm. when I made it a DVD. Because yeah. we're all different types of learners, we, too. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So if there would be a way to write a book, another book, mm -hmm. that would, would be an e-book that would combine both the written word and little snippets of video, yeah. example, I think that would be kind of cool. Yeah, I also think all of your work, along with the, you know, the scientific research about the mirror neurons and this feeds into our interoceptive mm -hmm. ability too, right? That, Absolutely. And that all the research that's gone on, that that really helps us in the aging process. Mm -hmm. If we have higher interoceptive skills, helps us exactly. with post-traumatic stress, helps us with irritable bowel syndrome, depression, anxiety. Mm -hmm. So it seems like our culture really needs this, this way of teaching. A long time ago, there was, I can't remember the guy's name, he wrote a book called High Tech, High Touch. It was like 30 years ago. Yeah. And he was seeing where the world was going in terms of where we are now, where yeah. everybody's going oh, like this gosh. all the time, you know. So we're disembodied because the minute you, you focus so tightly, you're married to that screen, whatever it is. And so what his, what his idea was, um, was that people will need more massage, more body work, more touch in order to counterbalance what he saw was going to happen, right? And so I think in a way what you're saying is the same thing, is that the kind of teaching you and I are doing is not necessarily about physical touch, but it's about touching, getting the person to touch themselves inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I was in a yoga class yesterday while you guys were filming the second workshop. Okay. And I had just taken your live workshop the day before. And you had been talking so much about widening your perception of all your senses and the, the sight, like seeing you, but also seeing what's around the room at the same time and hearing you, but also hearing the what's outside mm -hmm. and how that gives us an automatic lift, like our the antennas or the hair on the back of our right. neck stands up. Right. And I really love thinking about that. And when I was in the yoga class, I kept thinking, oh, I wish I could give this yoga teacher that cue for some of the things that she was right. talking about. Mm -hmm. Because 
it instead of um, posturing so much just that little bit of subtle sense helps everything flow out exactly it, okay. it, it affects the coordination of the whole system and so that goes back to the question you asked me first how do yoga teachers and Pilates right. teachers you know how do they use that well the first answer was in their own embodiment, mm -hmm. which in, improves their ability to see and assess. Mm -hmm. But also, I think it's about that cueing, because when you begin to practice, um, not just from your muscles, but from your skin, right? Mm -hmm. And from your sense of weight on the ground, um, which is something many people think they feel, but don't really. Okay, mm -hmm. so but once you begin to embody it and then practice it, then the words that come out of your mouth when you're teaching it are going to imbue that into the other person. Yes, and especially for group classes where you're not able to go around and do so much directional touch, yeah. it's wonderful to have that in your your toolbox. Yeah, yeah, right. that you can bring that that sense to the client. And this is the toolbox. Right. Right, right. <laughs> what do you think about this craze of fascia right now? Because that's sort of what everyone's talking about in the fitness world, because there's been so much research mm -hmm. about it. Well, I think Robert Schleip, mm -hmm. who's kind of been the main person, he's yeah. a rolfer, you know. Yes. Yeah, and so Ida Rolf actually put fascia on the map. Mm -hmm. Ida Rolf had two ideas. One was that the body structure was affected by gravity. And this was kind of like, really? <laughs> but it's so obvious the minute you think about it, but we don't think of ourselves as architecture. It just We're moving organic architecture, but mm -hmm. we're still affected by the planet. Mm -hmm. So that was her one idea. And the other idea was that fascia was the organ of structure, and that it Fascia is everywhere, and it penetrates to the cellular level. So how can it not be important? How can it be the stuff that the anatomists take off and throw in a bucket so they could get to the muscles and the good stuff, right? So she saw that fascia was important. She also saw that when there are tensions that pull the body out of alignment, then the fascia has to be what is hardening and thickening, not the muscles. The muscles are not that smart, you know, so they need, they need um, the fascia. So let's say you're holding your phone up to your ear, which please don't do. So after a while, that becomes a habitual tension in that shoulder. Mm -hmm. Well, it would be really inefficient for those muscles to keep firing all the time, to keep the shoulder up there. So what happens is the fascia that interpenetrates and wraps the muscles involved, just becomes stickier and thicker and tighter and shorter. So what Ida saw was you could apply pressure, slow, continuous pressure, and her idea was that it would sort of melt the fascia. We don't really know, okay? But I think it's from that idea that the, the bodywork fascia people have been able to connect with the academic fascia people, right? And then they did the first um, fascial conference in Boston in 2005, I think, or six. I was there. So not too long ago. Not too long ago. So it's only recently that Ida Rolf's brainstorm <laughs> has now become big news. Okay, And so what Robert has been studying and he went back to school and got his PhD and really did all kinds of, has done all kinds of research is that the way we exercise affects the state of the fascia. So that's, that is news, you know, so that no longer do we, you know, pump iron in the same way because that, that hardens and stiffens the fascia more. We need we need, we need to dance more, really, is what I think. You know, because it's, he's shown that it, this sort of bouncy re rebounding is what's good for the fascia. So, yes, we need to move like gazelles, but we do that on the dance floor. 
Yeah. So, um, and, and I think dancing is normal. You know, I think, I, I use it in my classes. I make my students, some of them really don't like it, but I make them do these improvisations because I think, you know, uh, centuries ago, that was our form of worship. It's very deep that we should move in order to express our appreciation for being alive. Okay. And that springiness of that, our children mm -hmm. is just, exactly. don't even think about it. Right. And so, you know, really sad that we're sitting in chairs. It's not normal yeah. to be sitting. We need more floor postures and... Floor postures so that we have to get up and down. That's what Philip Beach was talking about. Right, right. And I guess in, in walking, also, if we do it optimally, it's that same kind of springiness mm -hmm. that we have in the walk, the, our gait, our run. Right, yeah. exactly. But you see, unless you have perception of the space, Exactly. You're not going to be springing in a way that's truly beneficial. You can spring and it can be still just um, an event that you're making happen in your body because you think it's a good idea. Right. Okay. But if you spring because you're joyful <laughs> or because you feel the kiss of raindrops on your skin, that's a different spring. Yeah. This is a good point. We can't just start hopping around because our body isn't ready for it just yet. We have to do things to kickstart it, like put on music that in inspires us and feel the way that our body does want to start to move to start to fire that system up again. We can't just go run a marathon because oh, that's please. when we get in trouble. Right. Yeah. And so much of that marathon running is um, mentally in the sagittal plane. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? It's just mm -hmm. like there's so much intensity of getting to where you're going. And whenever you um, confine your vision, whether it's actual physical vision mm -hmm. or your inner vision, to one-pointedness like that, the body will compress. You've lost space. You've lost global awareness. Is that a survival mode? I'm sure. To do that? Yeah. I'm sure. Right. But the thing is, then we stay there. Mm. We get entrained yeah. into that way of being and we stay there. Mm. And then we go and have to have body work. Tell us what about your workshops that you filmed here. What were the, the names and, and how did it go? Oh, this is wonderful. <laughs> your, your husband is the most <laughs> generous, patient, filmmakers and I have no worries about it all coming together. Mm -hmm. The first one was about um, was it was about spatial organization, but it was also about about the general theory of space and ground mm -hmm. um, and also about specific places in the body where we tend to shut that down. And that workshop was about tensions in the face oh. and jaw and throat and how that area can be, be like a lid that prevents the midline from expressing its true length and, and resilience. So um, that was the first workshop. And the reason I chose that topic for a Pilates um, audience, and I've also taught that workshop live. In fact, that's what we did. Saturday, yeah, right? Yeah, which is amazing. <laughs> oh, yeah, Saturday. Yeah. Yeah, Saturday. <laughs> um, is that I, I think so much, so much of the time people effort and get into that sagittal uh, way of being when they're trying to do something right for a teacher. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times you see that effort in the temporal mandibular joint. And it doesn't get cued, and it doesn't get softened. And so then you're, you know, you're getting nice and strong in the core, but you're also getting nice and strong in your jaw, mm. which maybe you don't want. Mm. You know, I thought about this in the um, live workshop because one of my mm, mentors—I've never met her, but just reading her books—is Ida Mae Gaskins, who's a, who's a uh, midwife and doula. And she talks about the importance 
of softening the mouth and the tongue, the lips and the jaw, so that the cervix will open. Of course. And she works with her yeah. clients that way all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Well, the other the other workshop was about um, restoring our ability to yield to the ground, mm -hmm. to allow ourselves to be supported by the ground, which we think we're doing, but many of us are actually compensating by tensions elsewhere for the support that we have available. We just have forgotten how to access it. So that's what that workshop was about that and also about a few specific places in the body that if you can kind of trick them into feeling more weight, um, then that will change the coordination of gait. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's, that was the content. Great. Yeah. So in the, that second one, we'll see some gait training. Uh, not so much. Actually, I did more walking in the first one. Okay. So in the first right. one, you'll see people walking. And in the second one, I thought um, it would be interesting because one of my um, goals always is to make a transition between the studio and, and the life. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what is this exercise that you do on the reformer? You know, what good is it unless you can apply what you felt there in relationship to the ground, and then can you apply what you feel in your daily activity? So Casey, my volunteer in that second workshop, um, her daily activity is messing with the equipment, right? Having to change the springs and adjust the equipment. So we worked with how she could do that while feeling her weight. Oh, great. That's going to be really helpful yeah. to this audience. I think so. Well, Mary, this has been so much fun talking to you. My pleasure. I'm going like to miss you. I'll so miss you, much. too. Yeah. And your beautiful daughters. Thank you. And the Thank sky. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> um, You're so welcome. Yeah. Thank you. So by the time you've seen this, Mary's online videos are probably out. So check those out. Also, look below for information on how to contact Mary how to find out about her blog, how to find out about her fabulous book, New Rules for Posture, and her DVD. We'll see you soon.